Well, welcome everyone. First off, uh, I don't have a prop, so if that, I'm very sad that I don't have a prop. And second, I want to give five points to Ravenclaw because I did not do a Jennifer Lawrence up the stairs. So I'm very happy. That was actually, I kept repeating that in my mind over and over again last night. So welcome. Good morning, everyone. I want to say it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be surrounded by so many familiar faces and friends that I'll get to make in the future. Today, we're going to discuss the emerging separation between what we understand the paradigm of theming and immersion to be, mostly from my perspective and my journey in that. I want to start with a photo. This is Disneyland 1965. <laughs> so this photo hasn't been shown since 1965 to anyone except the people that have come in my living room. And that's because in the, sky, in the gray sky bucket way up there, that's my grandmother and my mother. And this picture was taken by my grandfather on their way back from Japan when they lived in there for the airports. And I always like to joke that the reason that woman over there who looks like a time-traveling Lady Gaga is looking at us <laughs> is because I guarantee you my grandfather in his thick, thick southern accent is screaming, Patsy, Patsy, look, as if she could hear him in turn and be seen in the photo. It was a different time. <laughs> so this photo means a lot to me, one, because it's so beautiful, but two, because it indicates the type of passion my grandparents had for theme parks, for the different places they visited in Germany and Japan. And my grandparents actually raised me. And growing up in Central Florida, they took us almost every other weekend as a way to sort of escape the realities of an otherwise un unusual childhood. And we went to many Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Parties, uh, back when they used to give you a free photo and a free button. I have all the buttons from all the years. And what's funny is, well, besides the fact my grandmother would probably be really upset that I'm showing this picture, there's me, I was very blonde, and there's my sister, who hasn't changed a bit, and my grandfather. My grandfather's still with us, and my, I lost my grandmother about two years ago. It was a seismic shift in my understanding about how we embrace joy and how we embrace our lives and how we embrace the experiences in our lives and how they color the way we move forward. So I might touch on that a little bit as we move forward, but just keep that in the back of your mind. This is me. It's Christmas. If anyone knows me, I love Christmas. I'm obsessed with Christmas. I will not start putting it up until Halloween's done, but it might creep in a little bit here and there. I find ways to find Halloween decorations and make them look like Christmas decorations. And so here's me with my first Magic Kingdom playset. And then here is my sister and I at Dollywood. We went to Gatlinburg a lot growing up, and we went to Dollywood as many times as I could count. All of this led me to then move from Melbourne, Florida, where I was born and raised, to Orlando when I went to UCF. And when I went to UCF, I got a chance to work at, well, I went in back when they were really looking for people and I said, I want to work at the Haunted Mansion. And back then they said, yes, okay, great. And they put me in there and I got trained at the Pirates of the Caribbean and I worked there for three years and it was incredible. And the things that I got to experience and the people, the guests that came and touched my lives more than I touched theirs. I got to work uh, on Main Street and operations. I was able to work in education and photo pass and I moved over to SeaWorld and what a great experience that was as well. All of these experiences combined with the fact that my grandparents were just passionate about any type of themed experience or any type of, of festival or parade led me to really come to the understanding of something, yes, we all know, but I believe should st st still drive us every single day. And that's that theme park design and themed entertainment, our industry is an art form. Now, of course, everyone's saying, of course it's an art form. Look at all the beautiful concept renderings. Look at the beautiful facades we create. Look at the scenery, the audio, the video. Yes, but do we think of what we do as an art form? Do we take it as seriously as filmmaking? Do we take it as seriously as painting? Because we should. And the way that we touch people with the experiences that we create, it's incredible, and it's actually unparalleled, I believe. We get to capture people for an entire day from 8 a.m. to midnight. When you make a movie, you only get to capture people for two to three hours. And they may leave in the middle of it and go to a bathroom, and they may miss a pivotal part. But the way we pepper in story, even in a very lightly themed environment like Six Flags, those types of things stick with people, and they resonate with people. That led 
to an understanding of the transformation of out-of-home entertainment. And I use out-of-home entertainment because it's very important that we understand if you can do something in your home, such as put on a PlayStation VR headset, should we be doing that in a theme park? Unless we're expanding it to the point that it's actually adding to the story. Out of home entertainment, if you, our screens are getting bigger. Our screens in our living room are enormous now. People at theaters are starting to have to make them IMAX. We're having to start putting in um, move, moving seats, play places in some of these theaters. Because what we can do on our home is starting to become more and more like what we were able to do 20 years ago in theme parks. One of the ways that we frame the way that we design and look at themed experiences is often through a post-Disneyland lens. I guarantee you, every single one of you has heard, what if it's just like this? What if we do it like this at Disneyland? What if we do it like Cars Land? What if we do it like, uh, what if we do like Pirates? What if we do it like Haunted Mansion? Everyone wants the thing that was done before. But here we are taking the things that came before, breaking them apart, and making this new frontier. I consider the first generation of modern theme park design, this is a survey, it's not necessarily including Tivoli Gardens or the Columbian Exposition or Barnum and Bailey, but I believe it started with Walter and Cordelia Knott and his partnership and his friendship with Walt Disney. Here we have an entire studio with all of their artists ready at the willing uh, with incredible concept art from Dorothea Redman, incredible minds like Mary Blair, and the way that they were able to combine all of their genius in the studio and translate that into Disneyland itself. Of course, then we have the New York's World's Fair, which again brought an entire new revolution to what we experience in theme parks, and audio animatronics started making their debut. And I believe the first generation culminated with the opening of Walt Disney World, my grandparents took the weekend off of work and made sure they were there on opening day, and I don't believe they saw Julie Andrews, but I like to think they did. The second generation of modern theme park design, I believe, started with Epcot. The teams that got to work on Epcot looked at every single thing that came before, every World's Fair, Magic Kingdom, Disneyland, and they said, how can we make this bigger? How can we make this better? When we learned that the guest paths were too small at Adventureland, we need to make sure that the guest paths are large enough in Epcot. And they made things bigger, they made things larger. The way that technology fused itself into Epcot Center was something that we had never seen before. It made its way to Tokyo Disneyland all the way through Euro Disney, now Disneyland Paris, and of course Animal Kingdom to what I believe is the end of the second generation with Hong Kong Disneyland. Now there are definitely fades at the beginning and ends of all of these, but I had to put something on a slide. When we look at the third current generation, the one we're in right now, the one that's a renaissance, the one that everyone, the reason we're here, we have a few things to look at. We've got the Wizarding World, Cars Land, New Fantasy Land, of course, Shanghai Disney Resort, and Pandora, the world of Avatar. I want to look at two of those specifically. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter, when it opened, and I was finally able to go to it, touched me and changed my life in a way that I never ex imagined a themed experience could, especially as an adult. Walking through there will bring you to tears. The world's most harsh cynic will at least kind of, oh, well, yeah, this is, this is good. I don't know anything about Harry Potter, but this is good. And when you turn the corner in Diagon Alley, you, you know it's something special. In Pandora, the world of Avatar, if you haven't had a chance to get there, or if you're waiting until we go at IAPA for IAPA Celebrates, you're in for a treat. And spoiler alert, I'm going to pull up some of the details. When we look at the Wizarding World, Hogsmeade in particular, and what its impact had on islands of adventure, the first indicator something was different was the construction signs. Gone were the construction signs that said, Universal is creating stardust, pardon our stardust, or whatever the phrase might be at the time. Instead, we have the Ministry of Magic specifically giving us a sign that says, magic at work here, pardon our dust. Something's different. Storytelling is automatically changed. In the Wizarding World, we also have special merchandise that is not just Universal Orlando candy. Here we have candy floss and we have it, it's packaged in a way that the branding worked with the marketing from the movie, the graphic designers from 
the art directors from the movie, everyone carefully thought about the way that things were packaged in a way that we had sort of forgotten, the way that we had sort of merged all of the Disney merchandise into sort of a one Disney when you go to Epcot, you can buy Disney Parks. When you go to Magic Kingdom, you can buy Disney Parks. When you go to Islands of Adventure or Universal Studios Florida, you can buy Universal Orlando merchandise. And someone said, no, I understand retail, our stakeholder retail, that we have to make a certain profit and that we have to have a certain ability to put as much merchandise in as possible, but we have to have a story. You would not be able to walk into Hogsmeade, the actual village, and buy Universal Orlando merchandise. So luckily, they've got it stocked full with incredible merchandise from the movies and books. In addition, we have signage that's not like the old days of just putting up a sign and putting maybe a lightning bolt or putting it in a very Harry Potter font that just says men or women. We have an actual sign that looks like it could be in the village. And we've got lighting fixtures that break the mold of what theatrical and architectural lighting are and they're actual antiques or they're actually art directed pieces. When we look at Di Diagon Alley, which transformed the way that I look at theme parks today, if you sit and spend any time in the Leaky Cauldron or the Three Broomsticks and you look up, suddenly your imagination starts to spark. If we can create that, the sense of false portals where you don't know what's happening behind that door. The door's fake, the wall's fake. It doesn't go anywhere, but you don't know that. And you're, once you've allowed yourself to think and sit in here and think, I'm a participant in this story, you start wondering, where's everyone going? Who lives in this hotel? Who's staying here? That is free. Everything that a guest can make up inside their head, every moment you can allow someone to make up just a little bit in their head, not only is it rewarding for them because they've come up with something, it is free. All you have to do is create a sign. At the Tower of Terror in Florida, there's a sign off to the side of the queue that says tennis courts, and it has an arrow pointing. It just points backstage. But if you're a guest, that sort of world building allows you to go, I wonder what that tennis court would look like. It wasn't in the movie. It wasn't in the ride. And it allows you to create that. You don't actually have to build a tennis court. You don't actually have to build any sets. It's free. The more that we can add that, the better to our immersive worlds. While if you went to Gringotts in real life, you would not see the Harry Potter name above the entrance, we don't have a square marquee up here with some vinyl printing on it. We actually have a beautiful, beautifully crafted thing that allows the book titles and the movie titles to transform over to the attraction name itself. We have pram parking, stroller parking. Anyone that's ever spent a good deal of time in a theme park knows that your ankles are gonna get damaged. That's why I wear these boots. Uh, your ankles are gonna get damaged by strollers left and right, and there's no place for them to park. But it's a necessity. So when, you are, when you're working with operations, when you're working with all the stakeholders in your attraction and your land, bring them in early. Because they're gonna say, well, I need this much stroller parking. Bring them in early, designate a spot for them, and fit it into the story. What I love about this sign itself is that universal employees are called team members. However, here we have bank staff. It doesn't, the backstage doors don't just say team members only be on this. It's written into the story. Now, I thought that we had hit a peak with the Wizarding World. But I believe that the transformation that happened from before Wizarding World to after Wizarding World has happened, that same leap has happened again from Wizarding World to Pandora. Of course, it's got beautiful scenery. It's got gorgeous plants that have been scenically created and light up and merge seamlessly with real plants. And it's got really good merchandise that's themed to the story. However, what it has more than anything else, and if you just spend a few hours and sit and watch guests interacting with this world, you'll understand it all comes from the layers of details. This, I love this picture because it shows you, this is holding up the wait time sign for Flight of Passage, which is the, one of the two attractions in the land. The way that not only is the ground bioluminescent, not only has it been stamped to look like Pandoran soil, they had to think not only what does this pole look like that's gonna hold this up, but how does it attach to Pandoran soil? Because it's not gonna attach the same way we attach it to Earth soil. You'll understand when you work with multiple stakeholders that you'll have to include many things in your design, such as AED machines and telephones and emergency response type items. 
And you'll want to include those into your story in a way that is visible in case someone actually needs to use them, but also blends seamlessly into the story. Here again is that same sign, and you'll notice for one of the first times in theme parks, there is no marquee for a flight of passage. They have the required operations of the fast pass return window time and the standby time, but you'll be hard pressed to find an actual marquee because if you were in Pandora, it would not say, and here's flight of passage. It would say, here's the entrance that Alpha Centauri Expeditions has allowed us to go on this expedition and here's where you enter it. I love, and by love I mean I loathe, uh, how much 3D glasses need cleaning machines, they need drop-offs, they need cleaning buckets, they need the ability to access the back of house so that you, there is a whole world that goes into 3D glasses themselves. But if you don't think about that at the very beginning, you're gonna end up with a trash bin with a trash bag inside it. If you think at the very beginning and get these stakeholders in right away, you can say, no, no, when we have return bins, they should look like they were made by Alpha Centauri Expeditions. I love this detail. On the exit ramp for unload, when you're finally making your way to the gift shop for Flight of Passage, every single thing that the humans brought to Pandora in the hundred years after the movie, which is when Pandora set, a hundred years after the movie, they have, they have ethernet cables, they have networking cables, they may not need to use that anymore. So when they're building additional things, they said to themselves, the people that live on Pandora and the Imagineers, that we would wrap this with an ethernet cable because we're sustainable. We're not gonna just throw it in a dump. Use every single thing the way it can and that's how it folds into the story. And then we've got incredible specialty lighting along the queue path itself. One thing that stuck out to me as a guest when I was walking through Pandora was how I looked at this and I went, oh, this isn't seamed. This isn't welded and seamed together. This is like beautifully welded, beautifully smoothed out. And it's curved because this is Pandoran metal. This is a Pandoran material. We don't just have clamps clamping together metal that you would buy on Earth because they would not take that with them on the spaceship. In order to get this type of detail into the actual land by opening, this decision had to be made very early on. This decision had to bring in the stakeholders from operations. You had to have a great understanding of what your occupancy was gonna be for your queue. You, if you're going to make an immersive experience, you have to bring in as many people to the table and have them have a voice as early as possible because if you decided to do this a week or two right before opening, it wouldn't work out. And sometimes you'll forget. Sometimes you'll forget, oh, I never brought in security. And now you've got security cameras plastered all over because you didn't bring that stakeholder in early enough. Along the cafeteria itself, since Pandora set generations after the first movie, which cast members there will call a documentary, um, they've removed all of the military equipment. And this is important because what's left after you remove equipment that's been there for a long time? Well, the stains behind underneath. Operations is going to dictate that you have placeholders where anyone that stands, because people are trained, I'm gonna stand on a number before I get in this boat, I'm gonna stand on a number before I get in this roller coaster. Well, if you have to have a number, blend it into the story. They've done that here with Pandora by making it an actual survey marker. And there's my pink shoes. And what I love about this sign is that it blends storytelling signs with real signs. Because you can get wet from the things that are inside the water itself. You can get wet, and so what they've done is they've created a story, but also a warning. And then one of my favorite things is that here, for one of the first times ever, you don't see cast members only. If you're inside Pandora, if you're inside the threshold of the land, everyone that's inside that land that works there works for Alpha Centauri Expeditions. They're staff. They have traveled from Earth, it took a very long time to get there. They'll tell you how long their journey's been. They'll tell you how long they've currently been working with the expedition. This is very key, because if Disney's gonna break their cast member nomenclature in order to tell a part of the story, then you understand that every single detail, all the way down to how you call your employees, is important. This brings me to the shifting design paradigm. Our language is shifting. 
the fact that we have an entire conference dedicated to immersion means that our brains are starting to change about the way that we tell stories. When I look at theming currently, I think of it as a design approach. Say I'm going to make a mid-century, I'm going to make a mid-century um, home, or I'm going to make a boardwalk at the turn of the century. I might make an Edwardian Main Street, but you're not you're not going to make people that work there Edwardian. You're not going to have them wearing Edwardian dress. You're not going to have them have an Edwardian backstory. You're theming it like it's Main Street. Therefore, I believe that we're shifting toward immersion as a design paradigm. I use the word paradigm not because it's a buzzword, but because it, it literally means the network and the systems in which we conceive how we approach our work as an industry. Every decision we make, if we choose to go with immersion, starts on day one. It decides who we contact, who we bring in, how we bring them in, when we bring them in, which is important. But since we're so quickly running into this new paradigm, I want to reclaim some language. Immersion as a design paradigm, meaning the way that we do our work, not how we immerse guests, but immersion as a design paradigm is not full theater projection mapping. That is a technique and ways to fully immerse guests with media, but it is not a design paradigm. 4D theaters with screens on three sides is a technique, but it is not how we approach our daily work. And wrap around large screen monitors, while beautiful and while the, the resolution and all the colors are getting really gorgeous, it is not how we approach our work from day one. It is, however, Storytelling in every single detail possible. Every one of them. And that can be taxing. And that can be exhausting. And the challenge is, if you're going to take up the arms of immersion, you have to be ready to fight. You have to be ready to be an ambassador and a steward for every single design decision. Because when you get the stakeholders from security, from maintenance, from operations, from retail, from food and beverage, every single one of them is going to challenge your decision to not just have hot dogs and hamburgers in the restaurant, to not just have black and white security cameras. You're going to have to have security cameras that fit the theme, that fit the story. Is this a world where there aren't security cameras? How do you integrate that in? And if you don't make those design decisions and stick by them at the very, very beginning, you're going to make compromises. It's also multi-layered, and it's physical. This might bristle some people because I know that currently, right now, we are not enough capability to have VR completely be so real that you forget that you're having, wearing a headset. We may get there. And we may be able to tell immersive stories. And I'll, I'll eat my boots in 10 years if we're able to get there. But right now, it's physical. Right now, it's all the way in the way that the sounds and the music. When you're in Pandora, the music switches from daytime to nighttime. Well, first off, there's no music. It's just animal sounds. The music switches to predators at night. The sounds of predators preying in the bushes. And it slowly transitions in as you go from Africa down into Pandora itself. It gets louder, and the thunder of the jungle gets louder itself. Here's where it gets a little gushy. I believe that immersion is how guests move through the space, not only physically, but emotionally. We all carry with us a lot of baggage. We carry a lot of hurt. Every single one of us has been affected by 9-11. I know that I was greatly affected by the Pulse shooting. And I know that last, this week, we have all been scarred by what's happened in Las Vegas. The way that we create these experiences for guests who have saved up for 10, 15, 20 years to have a vacation with their family the moments that they're creating, the light and the joy, which is the most vulnerable emotion we can possibly feel. We create incre incredible things for people. When guests move through our spaces, we are changing their lives. We're changing for a moment the way they perceive their children, the way they perceive joy with their children. And I couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better thing for us to do and a more uplifting way for us to get out of bed and make sure that we're doing the best we can each day at work. It's also 
a driving force in every design decision and every production decision. It must be decided from day one that if your team needs a Pandora, if your team needs a Wizarding World, your budget, your schedule, the way you procure items, the way that you integrate your vendors is a drastically different way than our traditional approach to theming a space. Every single detail matters. Which leads us to immersion is a catalyst for transformation. Theming says, here I am. I'm in Edwardian Main Street. Inside mine, you're going to find Disney Parks merchandise, keychains of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. But outside, we have facades that evoke all the transitions that the Victorian era went through, the struggles with Edwardian architecture that's blended with past architecture. However, I believe immersion says, here you are. When you walk through Pandora, you're a character. You're walking through a space and are able to interact with storytellers that cast members who are making up most of these stories themselves, who are able to pull out of their own world and their own experience and their own joy and pride for working in these lands and give you a little piece of their story. Oh, oh gosh, my animations. Theming asks, listen to my story. I'm a boardwalk. Hear my beautiful music. Isn't it fun to be here? Immersion asks, when you're here, you need to create your own story. It's actually asking guests to do much more than just push their stroller around and eat a churro. It's saying, when you're here, life is what you make it. This land is what you make it. This attraction is what you make it. You can get a lot out of it, or you can get very little. It's all up to you. Immersive environments transform the stories we tell ourselves. If you come into Pandora, or to the Wizarding World, or even to a museum where we have an incredible experience that made you for a moment forget that the night before there was a domestic, there was a domestic conflict in your home, or there was a shooting down your street, or there was an accident on the five south on the drive up here that you might have seen. We are constantly bombarded with conflict, with things that suck our joy out. When we are walking through these spaces, we tell ourselves and we transform, oh my God, I'm in Diagon Alley. Everything I've ever wanted to do, everything I've ever wanted to be for the last 10 years, I get to do right now. It's a gift. It's what we do is a gift for people. The stories we tell ourselves transform our lives. Every single day, we make up stories. We make up very shitty first drafts about who we are, how we're going to present ourselves. I, I, you know, I, I picked 10 different outfits before settling on this one because I just, I just gave up. And I was like, well, they're going to either look at my skinny jeans and boots and go, or just keep moving on. We tell the craziest stories in our heads, but each one of those creates a perception and a reality all on its own. As artists, and every single one of us are artists, regardless of our role, regardless of how we touch a project, we're artists because this is an art form. Would you ever say that filmmaking wasn't an art form? Filmmaking is definitely an art form. And everyone from the grip to catering to the actors themselves is an artist. And they bring the art form to life, and that's what we do. We have the responsibility to make sure that the things that we create within our budget and within our schedule are as good as they possibly can be and that they touch as many people as possible. You know, one of my coworkers once said to me, I, she, she said, I don't really feel like this small attraction we created is, is really going to make an impact. And I said, well, in the state that it's in and in the city that it's in, it's a high crime rate. And there's a lot of baggage that comes with the people that come to this event. There's a lot of baggage that comes to the people. And if for a moment they can sit with their child and forget about the things that happened to them the day before or what's happened to their neighbor or about having to take their neighbor to, can to cancer treatment and they can just look at their children and live in a little bit of light, then it was worth it. And I think as an art form and as the way that we touch the guests and the way that we make guests the paramount design decision in everything, 
That's our responsibility from day one. That responsibility is why I truly believe that this is an art form. As we look ahead, every single person in this room is going to jettison out and touch five, ten other people's lives and the way that they get back to work on Monday, the way that you just make decisions about how to schedule meetings, who you're bringing into those meetings. We have the ability, as we move forward, to actually not only entertain and reassure people, but slowly change their lives. We have the ability to change the national conversation around joy and what it means to experience joy and what it means to experience light. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you. It's always tough to go first. You did a great job. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes uh, for Q and A. Anybody has? Any? And we, I think we have a couple of microphones in the audience, so everybody can hear the questions. Um, just if you have a question, please raise your hand, and somebody with a microphone will trip over your feet. I feel like Judy Garland at the palace. Very excited. Hi, I Hi really enjoyed your talk. Um, as one of the people, few people in here that's not an artist, I'm an economist, I, I, I got a question for you. I, I really like the way you identified all the details of Hogwarts and that some of them of which I frankly hadn't noticed. Um, and you did the same thing in Pandora, the, the theming and immersion was all about the details. Yeah. Um, but those things had massive budgets, right? So I guess my question to you is, if you don't have a Disney or Universal budget, how can you accomplish that? Well, that's a great question because one of the things I identified in my research is that neither one of them is good nor bad. If you decide to go with theming, strictly theming, and pepper in immersive moments, that's fine in itself. But you're setting up an expectation, this is our budget, this is our schedule, we only have this much scope to give out to different people. We're going to do the best we can and I actually believe that if we start, so the threshold for theming used to be at load. You go on Peter Pan's flight. Once you're actually in the pirate ship, then your story's begun. Then with Indiana Jones Adventure and other attractions, we pulled that threshold to the queue. Now at Greeter, we've, that's when your story begins. What we've done now is we've pulled it all the way to the entrance of a land. That's fine, but that has huge, as you said, budgetary implications. So if you're going to decide to do an immersive experience, if you can't afford to do an entire land, make the parts you can do really well. There are some challenges and compromises that are made in the wizarding world and the fact that muggle money doesn't work in the wizarding world. So they have to have POS machines from our world in there. That's a compromise. You could spend thousands and create some whirly gig way of converting right on the spot US dollars or RMB to, um, what is it? Galleons, yes, into galleons, but that's not practical. So I believe that what you have to do is have a value system at the very beginning of a project and go, this is as far as we're able to take it. When we can't, these are the compromises that are gonna be acceptable. There, Am I next? Hi. Okay, I'm next. Hi, I'm Andy. Um, in uh, storytelling uh, or immersion, as you call it, you're, you're asking the guests to learn something on their own, like look at things and wonder what that's about. Mm -hmm. um, I always kind of, uh, I'm on the fence of, I know so much about something that I want the next person beside me, hey, did you notice this? Did you know why that's there? And it's a hard line to kind of keep it to ourselves and let them do all the exploration. For example, if I'm in an art museum and I know a certain painting was done for a reason and there's something hidden in there, I want to share that with someone, but sometimes people don't want to know. They want to, they want to figure it out on their own. And how do, you, how do you draw that line of, we're not going to tell them everything, we're just going to put all these layers in, but keep it all to ourselves and let them figure out what they want? Now, that's a good question because it's more about showing and, than telling. Yeah, there's a fine balance. As a guest, I can't stop 
help myself from rambling to the guests around me. Did you see this? Look at this design. Like literally, look at this plant. It is a foot away instead of two because that's how they would they wouldn't have had a reach to two. And the, most guests are like, oh, okay, that's great. But every now and then, you'll connect with someone. So as a guest. Please, we are inextricably, inextricably connected as humans. And the more that we can connect, we are so divided. We're so divided and social media divides us even more. When we're face to face with guests, so as a guest at an art museum and these theme parks, the more you can share with people, the better. Even if they look like they don't want it, they're gonna think, oh, hmm, interesting. That guy told me about blank. And they are going to feel smarter. They're gonna feel happier about that. However, as storytellers, we're gonna have to tell people who haven't seen the movie, for example, who haven't seen the story, who haven't read the certain things that we're presenting, we're gonna have to give them sort of a Cliff Notes version of it in a way that's not pandering to them, the way it's not condescending. So it's a challenge. As a guest, I'd say connect as much as you can. Literally just go around and just like, don't touch people, but like go around and tell them as much as you can about things. As storytellers, if we can find ways to weave that into the colors, to the light, to the sounds and the audio. Like, that's how we can tell people. And when people are able to decide for themselves, one of the greatest gifts we can give our guests is the ability to say, oh, I figured this out. That moment of, oh, I figured this out is rewarding. And the more we can pepper that in, the better. Thanks. Any more? Hi. Hi. Hi there. Um, Your hair is fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I worked really hard on it. Um, so first of all, I'm from Texas, so bigger and better. That's, mm -hmm. that's our Closer motto. Closer to God. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have, so I agree that, the, that it's essential to put in every detail you can. However, what would you say is the line between immersion and sensory overload? I, I'm glad you asked that question because can an entire theme park be immersive? I don't know. I think that there's immersion fatigue. When I went, my last trip to Pandora, um, it was a long trip on a spaceship. My last trip to Pandora, it was so hot, so hot. I used to live in Florida. I couldn't live there. I'm so sorry for you guys that are in Orlando. God bless you. I can't live there. It's so hot. By 10 a.m., I was dying, literally dying. I had, well, no, I'm, I'm not dead. But <laughs> I ran around that land looking for water, and I couldn't find it. I ran around and I was like, I just need food. I did, all I had inside me was Starbucks. And I was like, I just, I need food. And I went to the restaurant. And I was like, I don't want this weird dumpling breakfast thing that's so beautiful and I'm so glad they did it. So I ran out of the land and went to Asia and got a standard American breakfast. Had my only options in the entire land been special food, I would have had fatigue and my day would have actually been ruined because I wouldn't have been able to get what I need. And I was going around, I was like, where's water? And they're like, well, in Pandora, water does Like, no, I'm dying. <laughs> so like, I need at times cast members to be cast members. And I need team members to be team members. And for them to understand when to break that. And I think that that's important in our design decisions as well. Because you can't have every single thing shoved at you be a story detail because it'll just, it will just be sensory overload. However, you can pepper them in in subtle ways that those that are looking can find them. You know, the way that we color pipes, the way that we paint special codes on them, they're little Easter eggs. Easter eggs are awesome. And those are a little less in your face. But man, I was hot. I'm so sorry. Yes, sir. You haven't talked about media and the suspension of disbelief. Uh, elaborate. What would you like me to? Well, you know. You know. I, I know. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> Raise, of hand, raise your hand if you have been on Flight of Passage. Oh, well, your lives have been transformed, I'm sure. Because never before had I ever thought that a motion simulator where I'm wearing a pair of glasses would literally feel like I'm in a waking dream. And I, it sounds hyperbolic, but it, when I got off that, I was weeping. I cry a lot, but I was weeping. <laughs> I watch a Designing, Designing Women episode and I'm crying. I got off a flight of passage and I thought, everything's different. Nothing will ever be the same. Like, I looked around at other guests, people that I had watched in line that were tough, tough men, and they're, they're tough with their children and their teenagers, and then they were off and they're like, oh my God, that was incredible. 
that suspension, for a moment, the buildup from the land itself to the queue, to the foliage, to the sounds, all the way to the media itself. You had a long time to suspend your disbelief. And if by the time you haven't gotten all the way to the ride vehicle itself and convinced yourself that I'm going to have a fun time and I'm going to suspend disbelief, because I believe it's a choice. You can walk into something and go, nope, these are flats. These, this is paint. It was made by people here uh, from all over the world, but this is in Orlando and I'm not in the wizarding world. You have to lean into that joy. You have to lean into the joy and allow guests, you have to assume the best and make the most generous assumptions about guests. Because if we think, well, people won't believe this, they're not going to, give them the opportunity to because I think they'll surprise us. And the more opportunities we can have to immerse them from the very beginning, instead of it just being a marquee and you get on a roller coaster, that's when you can build that suspension of disbelief up.